Hey everybody, it's Natalie Gold with the Gold Standard and I'm here with my dear friend, Jackie Harunian. Hey Jackie. Hey Natalie. So great to be with you. So let me tell you about this number one ranked divorce attorney in all of New York. Uh, she's a partner of the law firm Wizzleman, Harunian and Associates, established in 1976 and a recognized leader in the field of matrimonial and family law. So I'm not just saying that she's number one. She actually was voted such very recently. She's a highly experienced trial and appellate advocate. She believes, though, that a negotiated settlement is often the best strategy, especially with young kids and when co-parenting is desired. Her approach is straightforward, responsive, and client-focused. She emphasizes respect, compassion, during the entire process, which is not an easy process to go through divorce, and guides her clients towards a holistic and cost-effective resolution in their matter that's in their best interest. Jackie's also not only an amazing working woman, an amazing mom, an amazing wife, an amazing human being. So Jackie, it's such a pleasure to be with you. Natalie, as I've told you so often, I'm the, I'm the president of your fan club. I'm inspired <laughs> by you. You constantly raise the bar. You are just fun to be around. And I just want some of your magic to rub off on me. You already you're have an amazing it in spades, believe me. And I'm, I'm you're taking an amazing notes person. from you all the time. Thank you, as are you, my dear. So look, you know, you've done so much in your career. You are a young woman, you are a mother. You are a absolute pillar of strength for your clients. What's your secret? Oh. Uh, gosh, uh, I I'll tell you, and thank you very much for those amazing com compliments and probably the most enthusiastic uh, introduction I've ever had in my life. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not quite so young. I mean, I just turned 50. And so I paid right. my dues and my children are a little bit older. Uh, so they don't, uh, I'm sort of out of mommy mode in terms of day-to-day -day care, although I do a lot of cooking and feeding them on the weekends uh, because they all come home. But um, I really think the answer uh, for any woman, especially who's going to try to have it all, try to raise children, keep their marriage going, volunteer in their communities and have a career, uh, I th really think it comes from uh, just really never giving up and not losing that confidence and not losing that um, self-regard where you know that you can do it if you just put your mind to it. And this is something that I know you believe in. You believe in setting goals and aiming high. And I definitely believe in that too. And it has served me well. Um, I'm very happy to be where I am today. I am loving your RBG portrait in the back, Jackie. <laughs> and I know that yes. it's such a profound impact on your life. Yeah, it, I, you know, it is a, it's not even a week that since she's passed and for sure she is an inspiration, uh, not only to Jewish women, but uh, not only to lawyers, but for just people in general. She truly overcame so many obstacles in her life, overcame so many odds to get to where she was, the highest court in the country, the most respected jurist in the eyes of many. And I think today, uh, you know, we're a, a little bit more than a month away from a very important election in our country. And, and I, I happen to work in a very adversarial field where there's a lot of fighting. Uh, and that's really, unfortunately, part of what family law is. But RBG, notorious RBG, um, Honorable Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she really stood for building bridges with your opponents and speaking with civility and even one of her quotes is, uh, even if you disagree, you don't have to be disagreeable. She was a very elegant, intelligent, graceful presence. And I, I really am inspired by that part of her. And I really think more of us in this very divided time need to really focus on how can we reach across and find things that we have in common with people that we disagree with. And this is certainly something in family law it is really the name of the game. If you're really gonna survive, if you're really gonna prevail in such a difficult practice, you have to be a peacemaker and you have to constantly emphasize the benefits of peaceful co-parenting, of finding middle ground. Uh, and it's something that I happen to enjoy and I think I've really developed a skill in doing. Um, but not to say it's easy, it's not. 
Which is amazing, Jackie, because you know, typically when we think of divorce attorney, the image that comes or that maybe the media has portrayed is an older man with, you know, who's coming in yeah. razzle dazzle and he's going to make you suffer and may, and, and truly that is not the point of family law. The word family right. is at the root of everything you do. Right. No, that's very true. There's been a very big difference uh, in the way the law applies to families now because the laws have changed since 10 years ago. And it's true, it is still a male dominated profession in many ways. Uh, but I think, uh, and we have nine lawyers in my firm. Um, we have actually more men than women in this firm. Uh, and, and we all have different skill sets and different qualities that we bring to our cases. I do think that women are sometimes very good at building consensus and collaborating. And this is something women, I think we just, uh, Naturally. I don't want to say it's, an, it's natural. I don't want to say it's a nurturing thing. I think women, we have been conditioned by society to play nice and to uh, communicate and to resolve things as opposed to constantly fighting. And there is obviously a place for litigation, even in family law. Sometimes you have to go to court. There are cases that cannot be resolved. Uh, and, and in cases which is a big part of my practice, domestic violence or dealing with people that are mentally ill, you can't really settle in cases like that. Right. You have to go all the way. You have to go in front of a judge. You have to take very tough positions. Um, but most of the time, and I really do think most people, if they knew what the fallout was going to be by fighting, if they realized the financial fallout and the time, months and years, and the emotional fallout, you know, literally trying to destroy someone that is your child's co-parent, they would really think twice. And I really feel, um, you know, family law, you have to present the, uh, the options to, to clients. What is the best strategy that's going to suit their needs and their budget? And I feel an ethical responsibility, especially for parents with young children, to constantly remind them of the benefits of resolving disputes. Uh, and, and again, that goes back to Ruth Bader Ginsburg and, and many other role models I have had that have really taught me the importance of that. You can't fight. If you're constantly in fight mode, your body is going to have a physiological response. You're going to be stressed. You're going to constantly be running on adrenaline and a, a real toxic energy that sometimes really never goes away. And I do see it. I see families that fight for many years after their divorce, they're fighting and fighting that adrenaline response, it just becomes part of how they react. And it literally good. can kill a person. It can kill a person. It can kill a family. And ultimately it's toxic. It's a toxic energy to have. You know, no one wants to have an enemy. Uh, I mean, let alone an enemy in your own family, let alone someone that you're gonna see on the soccer field, you're gonna see them at school or even in a Zoom meeting or your child's co-parent is always part of the picture. Right. And you know, that's a good thing. I mean, we all want children. Uh, I certainly want my children to have a support network around them. I think it's great to have more people that love your child, that are looking out for your child. And if it's going to be your ex and even a new stepmother or ex-in-laws, uh, it's good to know that they care for your child and they love your child. And that's really something to be supported during the divorce process. And I try to be part of that. Listen, it's not, I always say, it's not an exact science. I can do the best I can. I can really try to push my clients in a certain direction, but it's not like it's a cookie cutter going to work right. for every case. It's emotional. It's very highly personal. Yeah. And look, yeah. this is a person that you chose to get married to. You chose to have children with and things fell apart. So of course there's emotional charge to it. I mean, obviously, right? So yes. Jackie, if you could give us some advice as people who... Look, no one says as a, as a goal, I want to get divorced. Right. So how do we, as a society, do better in our marriages so that's not the final outcome? Yeah, I mean, so I just want to mention, I, I'm married for 30 years. I'm a very traditional person. I married very young, and I believe in marriage. And I can't tell you how many clients I meet with on a regular basis that I talk them out of divorce. So the number one rule to preserve a marriage is avoid divorce attorneys. <laughs> uh, because, you know, in a longer marriage, maybe it's a little bit easier because you know, if there's a bad day or a bad month, eventually things will get better and things will, 
in shorter relationships, it's harder to have that sense that things will get better, that sense of better or worse. Um, obviously domestic violence is its own category. Yeah. Uh, that is not a safe relationship. And that is really my one, um, th the one thing that I think really is not safe to stay in a marriage like that. Although sometimes therapy and other things can be slightly helpful, but almost, almost any other thing, including infidelity, including extreme financial reversals, uh, including fighting and, and, and things that are really upsetting and distressing, you can overcome those in a marriage if you're willing to uh, build up that trust. And, and marriage counseling can be very, very helpful. But honestly, the number one rule to any relationship, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a friend, whether it's a coworker, uh, it's communication. You have to communicate. You have to communicate in the bedroom, out of the bedroom. You have to uh, give time to your partner. You have to listen. And you can't let any fight get to the point where there's extreme disrespect and, and almost to the point of abuse. There has to be uh, a, a regard for, for the relationship and, and a desire on both sides to preserve the relationship. And that's done by communication. It's done by kindness. It's by constantly reaffirming the value of the relationship. And again, it doesn't have to be just a marriage. This applies to relationships between siblings. Uh, you know, like I said, between coworkers, with your neighbors, you, there's a line you just can't cross. And if you do cross that line, you have to be willing to right away take accountability, apologize and make things right. And um, I tell my children, I mean, I have grown children in their 20s and I'm, I'm, I'm giving them advice about their relationships in and out of work. And um, I, I tell them the importance of taking accountability uh, and to be the first one to say, I'm sorry. And I hope that didn't hurt you. And I regret what I said. If you're not saying that a few times a week, you're probably not saying it enough. You yeah. have to take accountability for your own words and actions. Because what happens is when you don't do that, the negative energy and the mistrust and the miscommunication, it just kind of escalates and grows. And next thing you know, it's been a couple of weeks and it's a rift that grows into months. And, and it can happen in a family that was once a loving family. And next thing you know, the bridge is completely burned and it's hard to go back there. You have to constantly prioritize the relationship and, and avoid divorce lawyers. <laughs> you know, Jackie, I will say that you have an impeccable skill about this because we are currently two authors of a book that is about to come out. And there was some conflict. Yes. And you right away picked up the phone to me and said, think about the bigger picture. And what are we really doing here? And, you know, the way a, a woman or a man does anything is the way they do everything. So I can just see how you are very much an atypical divorce attorney, which is why you're the number one ranked attorney in all of <laughs> New York. It's you're saying to them, like, look, look at the bigger picture. What are you fighting for here? Sometimes we get in a fight with our spouse. We don't even remember what we're fighting about. Right. You know, I think that's a, that's a very good point uh, because what makes family law different from all other practice areas, although what you do is state law, there's some uh, overlap, is there, there are family relationships and there's a lot of emotion behind it. And to get any good deal, uh, you have to take emotion out of the equation. You have to think rationally not emotionally. And in the early days of a fight or a disagreement, like we had with our situation or with a friend in the early days, you know, the temperature's hot and people are upset and they're reacting and they say things and do things they really regret. And so it is exactly at that moment where you have to take a step back, allow the temperature to cool, take a step back and look at the big picture and say, is this something I wanna save? Is this a relationship I can save? Or is this a relationship I can say, F you, I'm walking out the door, I don't care. So that's the important thing. You have to take a look at the relationship. Is it worth saving? And almost always it is worth saving because even in a professional context, why would you wanna burn a bridge that you don't have to burn? Um, you have to really remind yourself of the importance of, of, of um, salvaging a bad situation and making it work. Uh, and I'm not saying that in an opportunistic way. What I'm saying is, it's just very good to have good relationships around you. And one of my favorite um, 
authors and speakers is psychologist Esther Perel. Do you know Esther Perel? No, I don't. She, yeah, she's a, she's a very well-known psychologist um, with a huge following in Manhattan. I don't know her personally, but I'm a little bit of a groupie of hers. Esther, if you're watching. Yes, she <laughs> writes that, exactly. I would love to uh, be part of anything she's involved with. But what Esther Perel says, and she's a, really an authority on the issue of infidelity in relationships, but she has this saying that has been said before, but the quality of your life really comes down to the quality of your relationships. If you have good relationships <clears throat> in your immediate circle, I'm not talking about online, LinkedIn, Instagram, oh. those are not really relationships in the same sense, but if the people in your circle, the 10 people closest to you care about you and have your back and, and, and that's good, you're gonna have a better life. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. 100%. Having those good relationships in your inner circle. And, and if they're not good, you gotta really do something about it because it's gonna harm you. You're so right, Jackie. And you know, look, in both of our fields, we're dealing with people with means for the most part. And you could be sitting in the most beautiful house with the most gorgeous art and the best jewelry on. But if inside you do not have the connection with your kids, with your spouse, with what's in, you feel empty. Yeah, it's really true. 100%. And, um, you know, it's a reality and I'm older than you. Uh, so I can really see this a little bit more clearly with my own friends and peers and community that there is such a thing as a midlife crisis. And it is a powerful thing for both men and women. And we know men and women react to getting older in different ways. Uh, but ultimately it comes down to really working on yourself. Because uh, going back to what I said before, I meet with a lot of unhappy women that are very quick to externalize blame on their husbands, you know, or on their children. And, and um, these poor guys are working their butts off to provide a nice life. And then in come in these affluent women that are unhappy and they need to look in the mirror sometimes. And I will tell them that, you know, why don't you work on yourself? Maybe six months or a year from now, you are gonna get separated. Maybe that is what needs to happen here. But before you make that decision, why don't you go to a therapist, work on yourself, find out what you need to do to really um, make the next chapter of your life a better one. Because otherwise to run into a divorce uh, or a separation without really having a life of your own can be a very bad move. And I know a lot of women and men too that do it and have serious regrets about it because it's not pretty out there, you know, to be in midlife or even younger um, when, when you really want to be with a family and be with your partner. And so work on your relationship, work on yourself, be a more interesting person for your spouse to come home to create some mystery in your relationship, some excitement. Um, you know, if your life isn't fulfilling, find out why, but work on yourself first. And, um, and it might be going to work, you know, volunteer work, something that can, that you have for yourself. And, and, and I've saved a lot of marriages actually with that advice. Um, yeah. Because the other part of it is that women need to have economic independence. They need to have their own money. And if you have your own job and your own fulfillment and something you're working on and better yet, if it actually leads to earning some income, you are gonna have unlimited options in your future um, and, and feel real accomplishment, which you and I have talked about many times. Women need to have their own economic independence. Absolutely. In marriage and out of marriage. We need, we need to own it truly and understand. Like to me, the term financial empowerment of women is a nice buzzword, but it really doesn't mean anything unless you can tell them the actionable steps and actually have them making their own money and protecting the asset. Absolutely. Very important. Very important. And going back to the issue of domestic violence, just briefly, I mean, a lot of women that stay in abusive relationships they do so because they have nowhere to go they have no financial ability to be self-supporting they don't have that confidence that you have that i have that everything will be okay even if they walk out the door um, and they end up uh, completely losing their self-respect uh, women really can get broken by abuse and they can be broken by uh, unhappy relationships it's really not a great idea to stay in a bad relationship even if there's no domestic violence, you have to find a way 
as a woman, especially as you head towards midlife, when there are hormonal changes and other changes and empty nest and, and lots of transitions in families that can really cause people to become miserable in their relationships. And so the answer to that is to find ways to uplift yourself, create self-esteem, create income, or at least save income, do something that's going to create um, more strength from an economic standpoint. When women come to you and, I mean, you represent both sides. You represent men Absolutely. and women. Yes, I do. A lot of men want to work with a woman attorney, especially in family law. Uh, you know, and I'm a, I'm a partner here in my firm. We have a, I've been working for almost 25 years with the same firm, believe it or not. And I have a lot of referrals and a lot of them are from men. They feel more comfortable opening up to a woman. And um, actually a lot of judges are women and, and a lot of clients think it's better if my attorney's a woman. I don't know if that's really the case or not, but uh, yeah. In I our love firm, that. That's have, amazing. Yeah, at least half my clients are men. It's very much an equal thing, yeah. Jackie, for you, do you find that when people are talking about infidelity, that men and women, either one sex is cheating more than the other, and why? Uh, well, I mean, I think the men still have the edge when it comes to more cheating. And I, there's statistics they're the, they're that- They're the better cheaters, is that <laughs> I mean, but that's not to say that women aren't cheating. I think it comes down to opportunity. You know, I think when men are out in the working world, away from home, with money in their pocket, it, there are more opportunities to cheat. But it also, and Esther Perel is good to learn about this, it also depends on what you mean by cheating. There's a lot of online uh, virtual cheating um, and text messages and screenshots and, you know, all this stuff that goes on. And so it really depends on what you mean by cheating. During the pandemic, um, there's a website called Ashley Madison. That's the online affairs that men and women, it was, it was in the news a few years ago, yeah. uh, where people have virtual relationships and set up real life relationships. And they said it has been a huge increase in, in activity online with online relationships, but increases for men and women. Okay. So it's both. It's definitely both. What Just to generalize a little bit about gender, um, I think men will stay in an unhappy marriage much, much longer than a woman will. Uh, as a matter of fact, most divorces are filed by women wow. because, because uh, men, I think, are a little bit better at compartmentalizing their home life from their work life. And they come home, usually the wife is, is, has a primary role in caring for children, not always. Usually she's doing more of the cooking and cleaning, but not always. And he's not going to really end that unless he has some place to go to, has another relationship lined up. Whereas a woman, you know, she will reach a point in the relationship where she's just, she, they'll come in here and say, I'm done. And that always means they have put up with as much as they can take and they're ready to leave. And, and, and they will not stay in that unhappy relationship. It's not enough just to have a house and a home. They want uh, life under their own terms. And, I say that because, you know, it's important for men to listen when their wives are overwhelmed, if they're working, if they're taking care of children. I mean, lack of sleep is not a joke. Resentment can build up to the point of rage. I mean, I meet with a lot of women that are just completely enraged because they're working, they're raising children, they're doing too much housework and their spouses are really not getting it. They're not getting it. And next thing you know, there's the sex life completely grinds to a halt. And then the communication goes out the window. And it's not surprising that a few months after that, there's cheating. Because the marriage basically is dying. If without communication, with resentment and anger building up to a toxic point, I mean, something is, is going to give. And so the key is to stop that before it gets to that point. And, you know, I've seen just hiring a cleaning lady can save a marriage. You know, having some help can clean a marriage. Uh, you know, sending the kids to the in-laws and going away on a trip can save a marriage. Anything that helps the, the family, the couple get back to a more uh, loving equilibrium where there's less stress and anger. And uh, every family has to kind of figure that out for themselves. I mean, anger cannot be ignored. You cannot ignore it. It will only get worse. And, and, and so that's really a red flag. If you're really at a point of fury, especially for the woman. She's pissed, someone better be listening because otherwise 
the marriage is not going to make it. Heads or at least fall, not- as they say. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Jackie, do you feel that you were meant to do this work in this world? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know that I would have said that as a younger lawyer, but uh, today I definitely feel that this is something that I enjoy doing, that uh, I certainly have built a career on doing. Uh, a couple of years ago, I actually got a degree in psychology, an advanced degree in behavioral forensics, because psychology is basically half of what family law is. It's relationships and it's how people feel and what's going on in their fight or flight response and mental health disorders and other things. So I actually invested in my career even more at an advanced age uh, because I really feel like this is something I I enjoy doing and I'm meant to do. So yeah, and I'm very excited about um, in the future opportunities to do even more because now my time is my own. My children are definitely not needing me too much after school. You know, it's a good time. It's a beautiful time to continue to spread your wings and fly and soar. And Jack, if you could leave us with the most important piece of advice you could give to somebody, what would it be? The, the most important advice uh, that I have certainly benefited from, because like everyone, I've had challenges and pretty significant ones, is to remind yourself that every bad chapter is temporary and there are better chapters ahead. And that's something that I can connect to the pandemic because we all know one day it will end. I can connect it to a bad week or month in a marriage and hopefully it can be overcome. Every setback can lead to a comeback. And every setback, you have to really deal with it and it might humble you, but it could set the stage for something incredible. And this all leads to a quote that I, I, don't, I wish I knew who it's from and I'm gonna look it up because I wanna give attribution to it. Um, but the quote is that life is short, but life is long. So life is short because you don't wanna put off things that you wanna do because you only get one life. So you've gotta live it and make the most of it and not wait for someone to give you a life. You, especially as a woman, you've gotta go out and grab your life because life is short. But life is also long. So even if you have to take a step back, even if there's been an illness or a job loss or a pandemic, life is so long that you will have a chance to rebuild and conquer the world and do amazing things. And that really applies to any person in any age. You have to have that optimism that there's more work to be done and you can follow your passions and get there. It's beautiful, so beautiful. It really touched me, Jackie, and you are just a very special human being that has the- Love you. I love you. You have the capacity to really shift people's lives. And uh, I'm just so thankful to call you a dear friend and to call you someone in my circle. And and thank God, I, I, to me, it's like you're a sister from another mister, you know? We're I feel the same exact way. I feel like this with you and- in a certain sense, I feel that with, I don't want to say men, you don't deserve that, but I really feel a sisterhood with other women. I feel like our obligation is to lift each other up and also work together with the men in our lives. And, uh, but ultimately, when women uplift each other, uh, there is no telling how far we can go. We have to really get there and hope that the be- hope, wish the best for each other. Amen, sister. All right. Well, I cannot wait to have you back on the show. This has been an amazing, amazing conversation. And for all of you who need someone with compassion to listen to what is happening in your marriage and your life and possibly even be the spark that saves it, please reach out to Jackie. She's the best. And uh, it's really, it's such a pleasure, Jackie. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Love you, Natalie. Thank you you so much.